Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm Lloyd Miner, Dean of Medicine at Stanford. For those of you who are visiting us here at Stanford for the first time, welcome to Stanford Medicine. And for all of you who are here today, thank you very much for joining us today for this symposium on the electronic health record. I've been interested in the topic of the electronic health record for a number of years. And the reason is that EHRs sit at the nexus of two areas that are integral to healthcare. One, in order to realize the full potential to improve the value of healthcare from the data that exists within electronic health records, we have to be able to make those data interoperable and therefore subject to the type of machine learning and artificial intelligence approaches that have transformed so many other sectors of the economy. So that's one reason, is the interoperability focus and need. And then, very closely related and of equal importance, is to use EHRs in a constructive sense to enable and to positively impact the impact, the interaction between healthcare providers and patients. And today that interaction is somewhat challenged. We need to, in the very truest sense, be able to have high-tech and high-touch medicine. And to do that, we probably need to rethink the interface between healthcare providers and the electronic health record. Now, I want to say at the outset that we absolutely don't want today, this morning, to be about pointing fingers or trying to assign blame. There is nothing productive to come out of that. And we do want this to be a productive endeavor for everyone. So what we hope will come out of today is some shared knowledge about where we are today and an understanding about the opportunities, and there are many opportunities for the future, and then how we can work together to realize those opportunities so that in the future we have healthcare data that are interoperable, and we have an EHR environment that really does enable and empower the type of high-tech, high-touch medicine we know to be possible. And there are lots of reasons for being optimistic. Just this past year, CMS announced a one-year study to address the burden associated with reporting requirements related to compliance. So we're seeing a tension devoted by our regulatory agencies on how we can make sure that those regulations for sure promote quality and service, but don't add undue documentation burden. And also, we're seeing countless examples of how already, even within the constraints that exist in the data architectures today, already data are being mined and used to improve the delivery of care. We're not gonna solve these problems overnight, but I'm convinced that the solutions are going to require people like all of you in this room together, coming together and thinking creatively about the future and working together to make sure that we address the challenges of today and succeed in meeting the opportunities of tomorrow. It's interesting to remember that it was less than a decade ago that the High Tech Act required that delivery systems and providers transition to electronic health records. And in less than a decade, we've moved from the percentage of medical records, of medical documentation, being in the electronic environment, the percentage being in the low teens a decade ago, now into the high 90s. That's a colossal transformation in a relatively short period of time. So we've moved from paper charts with little colored tabs on the side that we, all of us who've been around medicine for a while remember, not necessarily fondly, but remember, we've moved from filing cabinets of manila folders, now in some cases to filing cabinets of electronic data. Now for sure, we've already seen many benefits of the electronic health record. I remember when I was in training, for example, I can't even begin to count the number of 2 a.m., 3 a.m. visits that I made with a security guard to the office of a faculty member or 
the back room of a certain facility in order to track down a chart for a procedure that was being done the next morning. Because needless to say, many times they didn't make it back to the medical record room. And then also seeing patients in the emergency department with complicated medical histories that you had no idea what that history was, even though they'd received their care in your hospital four years before because the chart couldn't be located. Blessedly, those are times in the past that we don't want to repeat in the future. But we also, I think, collectively realize we haven't been able to fully leverage the power of the data that sits within the electronic health record. So that's an opportunity for the future. So to begin, in preparation for today's symposium, we decided we needed more information. So we collaborated with the Harris Poll, and you have the results of that poll at your place, uh, to get information about how primary care physicians perceive the electronic health record. We surveyed, the Harris Poll surveyed over 500 primary care physicians in the US. Now there's some initial results that may seem surprising. First, over 63% say that electronic health records have generally led to improved care. Now that's a good sign. So 63% of primary care physicians feel that on the whole, care is better because we have EHRs. And 66% reported being at least somewhat, somewhat satisfied with the current EHR system that they were using. But as the questions on the survey explored deeper and more complex areas, we noted a number of complexities. We noted that this approval of the EHR was nuanced and that there were many opportunities for improvement moving forward. So here's a snapshot, and again, the detailed results are in the packet that is at your place. 40% of primary care providers find that EHRs bring more challenges than benefits to their ability to provide care to patients. 69% say that EHRs take valuable time away from their patients. 71%, 71% say that the EHR contributes greatly to physician burnout, a huge problem in America today. In a variety, variety of different surveys, 50% or more of physicians in practice in the United States today are burned out based upon one or several criteria. Now, by no means am I suggesting that the electronic health record is the only factor accounting for burnout, nor is just, quote, fixing the electronic health record going to solve some very fundamental problems we have in our profession today. But it's certainly a contributing factor that we need to take seriously as we plan for moving forward. 59% of primary care physicians say that electronic medical records need a complete overhaul. And here, here's some startling results as well. Four in 10, 40%, say that the primary value of the electronic health record is for storing data. And only three in 100 primary care physicians, only 3%, say that the primary value of their electronic health record is to support clinical decisions. 3% feel that the primary value of the EHR is to support them in practicing the very best medicine that they can practice. Now, there's a story here that I want to relay to you. It relates to things that I did earlier in my career. I'm a, an otolaryngologist. I study inner ear balance problems. And in the 1990s, I saw a group of patients in my clinic who had a bizarre set of symptoms. When they heard loud noises, they got dizzy. And they could even, we could even see that their eyes moved when we played loud tones to one ear or the other. And I described this in a paper in 1998, and rapidly people in my field became aware of this syndrome, and we developed a, a, a surgical procedure to fix the disorder. It's a disorder caused by bone missing that should cover the top balance canal, the superior semicircular canal. And yet still, because this is not an incredibly common disorder, it's not all that rare, but also not that incredibly common, Still, many primary care physicians may see during the course of their practice one, two, three patients with the disorder. And they may not realize, for example, that when someone comes in and says, when I hear loud noises, I get dizzy, 
or when I, or this bizarre symptom of when patients hear their own eyes move, they, they have the sensation that when their eyes move, they can hear their eyes moving. They may not realize that this points to that disorder. And so a lot of people then made the diagnosis by simply doing a, a web-based search using a browser. And this is a picture of Adrian McLeish. He's a French horn player in Germany. ABC Medical Mysteries did a special on him about a decade ago. He diagnosed himself by doing exactly that. He could hear his eyes move, type those words into a search browser, and came up to our websites and papers describing the syndrome. He eventually got referred to me when I was at Johns Hopkins, and we did the surgery to fix it. The point is, he made, he'd seen many, many good physicians in Germany, but no one had made the diagnosis. No one had made the link to this disorder. He did based upon a simple web search. Now, that was a decade ago, but if you fast forward to today and you type into the chief complaint line of a, of the, standard, of the standard EHR today, hear my own eyes move, or noise and dizziness, any of those key phrases, and you as a physician get absolutely no help in making a diagnosis. Still, you would have to go to a web browser or your patient would have had to do the same thing in order to get on websites or pull up papers that link those symptoms that you may have never heard about before to this specific disorder. We can do better than that. And that, those are the types of things we need to change moving forward. Now, back to this Harris Poll survey that we did. The average primary care physician, the average of the physicians in this survey, spent 31 minutes in an encounter on behalf of their patients, 12 minutes interacting directly with the patient, and then eight minutes during that interaction with the patient, but interacting with the medical record. So in other words, the physician focused on the medical record. And then another 11 minutes interacting with the medical record on behalf of that patient after the patient encountered had entered. Now, so what it's saying is that a large proportion of time in the delivery of patient care is being devoted to the EHR. Now, Abraham Verghese, a professor of medicine here, had a wonderful piece in the New York Times Magazine a few months ago saying that, you know, we need to get back to the, the high-touch medicine that took most of it, brought most of us to being physicians, and that people, our patients, still expect from us. And we need to look at technology as leveraging and making these high-touch interactions between physicians and patients, the type of personal connection that people expect. We need to look at how we can fuel that. And one of the things in Abraham's article that he looked at was the number of keystrokes during an average 10-hour shift of an emergency medicine physician during that shift, the number of keystrokes with an EMR, it turned out to be 4,000 during a 10-hour shift. Now, lest we think that this is all a problem with the electronic health record itself, there was a wonderful study published by Chris Longhurst and colleagues in the Annals of Internal Medicine just recently showing that the same EM electronic health record system, namely the EPIC system, when implemented in Melbourne, Australia, and in Singapore, looks very different than an EPIC system implemented in the United States. And that, in fact, the note written by a patient, written by a provider documenting a patient encounter, was on average fourfold shorter in those countries than it was in the United States. And that that additional fourfold verbiage in the note in the US oftentimes had little to do with the actual delivery of care to the patient. It was rather to meet the compliance and regulatory related requirements in order to justify billing or any number of other compliance related requirements. And furthermore, their study went on to show that 